Mane, vi kommer til å filme. Eller jeg har sagt det at det ikke er filmet alle timer. Så var det greit. Og det er folk inn fortsatt med, tror jeg. Hvis dere synes det høres ok ut? Ja. Bra. I dag så skal vi ha om barn og unge i norsk idrett. Hallo! Så... I just started lecturing in Norwegian. <laughs> I can. <laughs> uh, but I only made it to the first sentence, so it's okay. Today we're talking about children and youth in, the, in Norwegian sports. Not only in Norwegian sport, but children and youth in sport. And this is a very relevant topic. Did any of you see the debate on the um, NIF? Uh, web pages that I linked in your Facebook. Did you see that? There was a debate yesterday about uh, poverty and, and sports. Children growing up in poor families uh, and there is this tendency that they are um, maybe not less active but they have more problems in, in um, involving in sports. So this is a very, very relevant topic uh, in Norwegian sports today. And almost every day you find in the newspapers something written about this. And it's about inclusion and it's about this whole ideal of NIF, which is sport for all. We have this whole, um, it is the ideology. NIF wants everyone to be able to do sports. But then there are of course critics saying, Sports is exclu excluding people. And uh, NIF doesn't cover, uh, or isn't an organization for every um, member of society or, or every group of, of members. So we're going to look at this today. Next time it's um, the same uh, heading is sport for all, but then we're looking at social class and gender. So these things are, of course, uh, linking together somehow. Why is this relevant for you, you think? It is quite evident or obvious that if you guys will work in sports organizations or in teams or any organizations really that is related to sport, you will have to know something about inclusion and something about who it is that we are actually, um, what kind of, uh, of dilemmas that may occur in this whole inclusion, um, idea of inclusion. So today we're going to look at sport for all. I know that you know this term, probably. We're going to discuss policies following this term. I want you to know a little bit or quite a lot about the status of children and youth in sports and in the NIF system. And then we have a nice little thing called children rights in sports. I don't know how that is in Germany if you have uh, written children rights in sports. Do you know? No? In Norway we have, um, <coughs> we have that. We will have a look at that. And then at the end we will look at the link between mass sport and elite sport. Because we have this idea often that one thing uh, pushes the other forward. And then uh, we'll look at some research that questions this um, causal link as they call it. Sport for all, what is that? Do you remember? <coughs> when did this sport for all uh, strategies or uh, this idea of sport for all, when did this become popular in Europe? Do you remember? Yeah, around the 1970, 1960s and 70s. There was this, there were th there was this um, common idea in Europe that, or they, they saw, you know, there were um, problems or lifestyle problems occurring because people were driving, you know, <laughs> driving more, um, 
when doing less physical activity, the work became more and more um, aut autom autom automatized. Or less physical, <laughs> less physical, more work in, fa in factories, etc. And there were more and more lifestyle diseases occurring in the European society. So there was this common uh, understanding that they needed to combat this bad trend. People were getting disease, people were getting diabetes, and all those things that weren't that common before. So they made strategies. And uh, sport for all was one of those strategies. We wanted sport so that everyone had the opportunity to be part of a system where these, um, for instance, these uh, diseases, etc., cetera, um, could be prevented. So each country in Europe that were part of the European um, Council, Europa Rode, they were uh, given different tasks. So Norway, for instance, were given a task to use mass media to, uh, to help um, enlighten people about physical activity. And that's why in Norway you could find TV shows in the morning or early, early afternoon where they were specifically trying to teach people how to be physical active. And then they were often targeting the ones that were at home that were actually watching TV. The same target group as the ones that are watching soap operas in the, in the morning. Um, and these were kind of strategies uh, that had political consent to combat these kind of diseases. And then after a while, UNESCO, which is a big organization, they also followed this track and they actually wrote down um, in their rights that doing sports and physical activity was a right for all, a human right. And all of a sudden, sports were becoming more and more um, um, accepted, can we say accepted, also outside the sports world, in general society. And sport for all was becoming a term that was more and more recognized. Everybody knew that sport for all was important. And then organizations such as NIF took up this, um, this uh, or uh, adopted this policy in their own statutes. Sport for all should be something that we should work towards. And of course, if we have this internationally recognized term in our, on our agenda, politically, uh, it's easier to argue for, for instance, money. If we say that our organization works um, towards a goal of sport for all, which is recognized in a much bigger um, political, um, what do you say, S structure or, or worldwide, then of course this is um, a very good argument for us in order to increase our activity. And in NIPS, idea of sport for all was of course everyone <laughs> in, uh, in the Norwegian society in our term or in Sweden they also um, they were also very serious about this concept and other places of course but um, but that meant a stronger emphasis on groups that weren't that much included before girls for instance weren't a natural inclusion in sports until the 70s. We know that football for girls, when was football recognized as a girl activity in the no Norwegian Football Federation? That was in the end of the 70s, and which is, that's quite late. Uh, disabled, they were a group that should be included in this, um, in this uh, concept. And strategies had to be made in order to, uh, to um, secure inclusion of these groups. So Sport for All, which developed there, is still following NIF, and they're still, argue, they're still arguing with this um, Sport for All um, ideal in, uh, in NIF. Did you understand that? Now when I ask you what Sport for All is, 
Can you nod your head? Yeah? Do you want to explain to each other what sport for all is? One minute. <laughs> Okay, that's good. The reason why I, uh, I challenge you on this is because this is a very, as I've said now a thousand times, this is a very central ideal of NIF. And in order to understand the organization, you need to understand this, that sport for all is the foundation. Everybody should be able to do sports. And then it's not necessarily, uh, it's not that we should always critically assess things. But on the basis or on the background of this, it's also, as we see today, important and possible to challenge NIF on this ideal. You understand? Because NIF has a responsibility. And why is that? NIF is just a voluntary organization, isn't it? Well, we need to, and I need to repeat for you, what we call this Norwegian sport model. We can say that it's, it's a Nordic sport model because it's much the same in Sweden and Denmark. But the point of this model that you will probably hear a lot about, and when you, when you read NIF's um, document, and you see this, the ideal of the Norwegian sport model is this and this and that. So what is this? Well, first of all, we have a public sport policy um, that sport for all, is the goal. Everybody should be able to do sports. And then in order to reach this goal, it's a governmental concern. They want to work towards reaching this goal of sport for all. And that's why they can, and also NIF, can argue for having funds, for instance. Because the government and the public uh, authorities have decided that this is important. And then there's also a division of labor in sports between <coughs> the public and the voluntary bodies. <coughs> when you're writing your exam, you will <coughs> <coughs> write about funding for sports, um, sports facilities. Uh, the public, when we talk about the division of labor, it's basically that public authorities public bodies, such as uh, the commune, um, the co um, help me please, <laughs> counties or, uh, yeah, they're paying for, uh, or, or um, paying for the facilities, or at least providing facilities, where it is NIF, as also say here, they're responsible for the delivery of sport. The different teams, which are part of NIF, members of NIF, and federations, members of NIF, they are responsible for sports. Public authorities are often responsible for facilities. And then there are, of course, some teams that have their own, own facilities, etc. But generally speaking, public authorities are responsible for facilities. And that's why we say it's a division of labor. OK? So NIF is the deliver of sport. But of course, they are. Uh, they are um, advisors in all this uh, facility building, etc. But it's, uh, that's also with a sport concern. And then we have this. We know that NIF is an uh, organization which is, cov <coughs> which is uh, including both elite and mass sport. It's one 
organization, a unitary organization. Um, and that is, of course, as we will see later, sometimes a challenge. And you will probably see it if you, maybe you see it even today when you're members of clubs yourselves, or um, um, when you will be leaders eventually. You might feel this tension between elite and mass. And also, we have the children's sport politics, which is an important part of the Norwegian sport model. Um, and that is decided upon, and it's implemented by NIF. NIF sets the term for these children's sports politics. To us, this sounds um, very normal, of course, because we, grow, we grew, <laughs> grew up in this system. Um, I told you last time that I was, I've done some research on, on um, projects Norway implements in, in the south, in Africa. And for instance, uh, we looked at this project in Zimbabwe, where Norwegian NIF, they were going to Zimbabwe and they were going to implement the Norwegian sport model in Zimbabwe. Do you think that was easy or is easy to take? This, this is an ideal, sports, uh, ideal way of organizing sports in our terms, right? It's very democratic, includes everyone. Well, obviously, to try to take this fixed model and trying to implement it somewhere else where um, the, the, what do we say? not only the environment, but the structures are totally different, is very, is very difficult. And even in other places in Europe, maybe even in France, it would have been difficult to try to implement a Norwegian model of sport. So this model works very well, of course, with some... Um, um, it's always easy to be critical to some things, but it works very well in our setting, in our social democracy. But it might not work well other places. Or maybe it would work, but we need some adjustments. But this is an important uh, um, understanding for you, especially for those of you who are going to work in Norwegian sport, to know what this is, the Norwegian sport model. Why is this, what does this entail? Okay. And now we'll move on to children's sports, which is the topic of today children and youth. And um, in order to understand children's sports in Norway, which is also a bit different from other places in Europe. Uh, for instance, uh, we, uh, we already looked at this uh, in, I think, the first lecture. Uh, for instance, in England, um, there is a, a lot more uh, sports run through the educational system, through schools. They have school sports and school teams, etc. In Norway, we don't have that. We have physical education in school, but we don't have the school responsible for the team. How is that in, um, in, in Germany and France? Do you have school sports or do you have club sports? Or maybe both? Sports. Both? But do you have... Um, It's high school, high school activity. But do do uh, like primary schools? Do they have teams and uh, in leagues, etc.? Like in England, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you're doing physical education, yeah. but the organized team activity is outside school. Yeah, <laughs> and in Germany. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's the same here, I think. <gasps> yeah. But it used to be like that in Norway. It used to be a school activity, and schools used to be uh, responsible for sports in um, in Norway. And uh, I want to just to show you a quick recap of why why children's sports and how it came to be a right eventually. Uh, because 
I want <laughs> you can you can think in your heads. I won't uh, challenge you to answer. But uh, children weren't really a prioritized group in sports, right? We had um, the worker sports union that brought children in, but children weren't really the um, main targets for sports in Norway. But then in the beginning of the 20s, you had um, a committee for school sports. They were going to be responsible for, uh, for uh, the voluntary sports in schools. Um, and after a while, we had the establishment of the sports organization. And then we see that children and youth are becoming a bit more important in NIF. Uh, because all of a sudden, we find committees appointed by the general board, general assignment, sorry, that, com uh, that appoints committees that are supposed to take care of children and youth issues in NIF. And then all of a sudden we see that children, as I said, are important. But it's still schools that is responsible for children uh, in sports. And you find this ideological struggle between schools and the sport movement. Because the sport movement, up until the 70s, is criticizing um, schools. Because they are, they are um, their teachers uh, are blaming sports, the sports organization, for hunting talents, for lacking pedagogical skills, um, <coughs> for uh, promoting competition, and thereby creating losers. Whereas sports organizations, or sports, um, the sports movement, is criticizing the schools, on the other hand, for, um, for uh, or, or claiming that teachers forget sports. It's not important. You, you don't prioritize. So we see that this is important for the children, but you don't really prioritize. So there is this ideological struggle, struggle and who should be responsible for children's sports. <coughs> and it's, it's taking quite a while. This is, this is a period where there are more and more children uh, doing sports in Norway until um, 1974, and then it's, then it's uh, NIF that takes over school sports. Schools are now doing physical activity, and NIF is including children and making children teams, etc., etc. Um, so that's, that's a part of the understanding here, that NIF is, is more and more uh, taking part in children's sports from the 70s. <coughs> <coughs> now we're getting close to what we're um, about to look at. In 1976, you were still not born, I think. That's correct. No. Uh, there were some guidelines for children's sports. And this comes as a result of what we saw earlier, the sports revolution. There are so many more children included in sports that are involved in sports, so we need some guidelines. We see that things may uh, improve. And we see that there might be some, um, some um, I won't say, um, yeah, there might be some um, challenges for children and sports, uh, on on a bad, in a bad sense, challenging, challenges. So we need to make some guidelines in order to secure children and their pr and protect children in sports. Uh, and um, in uh, eighty seven, these regulations are adopted by NIF's uh, General Assembly, and there are some regulate or regulations for sports now, for children's sports. Just recently, or at least not that long ago, these were revised, and now we call them children's rights in sports. So in Norway, <coughs> we have <coughs> quite specific rights for children in sports, and with the idea that we want to protect children from being um, 
from being uh, uh, utnitta, exploited, um, forced to compete, for instance, at a very early age, uh, because you have very ambitious parents that think that they're going to have a, a champion down the line. But there are protection uh, guidelines now, and it's not allowed. And NIF is taking these things very seriously. <coughs> um, and one of the reasons why they implemented this in the first place was that they saw that the way, uh, or the 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 way that um, children's sports, uh, or the direction that it uh, that it um, <laughs> today I'm very I'm kind of off. <laughs> Sorry, uh, the direction that it took uh, was not very healthy. There was very much of um, of um, um, specialization that children did only one sport, and every research tells us that to do many things, to be al city, what's the word in English, diverse, to show a big diversity in sports is good, to have a, a diverse uh, foundation. But there were more and more uh, teams and sports that were specializing. Oh, we need to hunt the talents now. Uh, and these are kind of things that they wanted to combat. And also that this early specialization made people drop out of sports. It's becoming boring when you do only one thing from you are eight, nine, ten. So uh, these were reasons for doing these regulations. <coughs> So who are the children and who are the youth? Let us look at that next. Um, before 1990, it was up till 13 years of age. Um, when you were 13 plus, you were uh, doing the same, you were under the same regulations as adults, um, or you were you were considered a youth, but you didn't you weren't protected in in the children's. Um, yeah, you were not a child. <laughs> um, and from 1990, they made two uh, distinct groups: zero to 12 kids, 13 to 16 youth. And both these groups needed to be protected or regulated somehow. 2001, we see that there is another grouping, <coughs> 0 to 6, 7 to 12, and 13 to 19. So the youth extends a bit longer, uh, being a youth uh, in sports. But it's also quite um, to have a group from 0 to 6 show that we we begin quite early. Um, to have a six, yeah, to have that as your first group of being uh, involved in sports, or that is quite early. In 2008, these are not the newest statistics, but we see that children under the year 12 uh, comprise 25% of NIFS membership. And children and youth is 40%, 41% of NIF membership. So it's a large group uh, in NIF that obviously needs to be taken care of. And uh, as opposed to adults, children don't speak for themselves in that sense. So they need rights more than maybe we do. In 2010, the kids are the most active members of NIF. And the average starting age for competitions is nine. That's from 2004. So this is more or less who these children, are, who they are. And there has also been an, a change in the understanding of children and youth sports. Um, it used to be uh, the target that upbringing and health 
What's the reason why you should encourage children in youth activities? Uh, we needed uh, healthy children. Uh, and that is still one of the arguments, but it's not the main argument anymore. Uh, and also in NIF, when they argue for children's sports, it's not necessarily the health argument, is it? Why do they argue, or what do they argue with? The content is important. The experiences they get. Uh, we say the good experiences they use, they use as this general term. They, um, they want people to enjoy the activity, uh, to try to um, pave way for, um, for a love of sport, a love of being, uh, of being active. So it's more, of course, these health arguments are in the back there because we know that if you start to uh, create good, um, uh, what do we say, good um, vana habits early, then uh, it's likely to follow you in, uh, in your life. If you're used to being active, then it's, it's likely that you will be more active when you, you grow older. So NIF, as I said, have some very specific children rights. And we're going to look at these uh, more, uh, more thorough just in a minute. You see that safety, security, friendship, needs, children's needs. The feeling of mastery is important. To influence, to be able to influence your own activities to choose. You shouldn't be forced to do something. If you don't want to play football, you shouldn't be forced to play football. And also that everybody should have the opportunity to compete. You don't only select the ones that are best at this point in a humble game. You're not allowed to say, OK, the six of you, your talents, you can play today. You're not allowed to do that. Everybody should have the uh, opportunity to compete. But of course, it's difficult. And the older the children get, the more difficult it is. And I think some of you, at least, that has worked as coaches, you will probably, probably um, experience this quite often. That this is not easy, especially when you have, this is OK, but then on the sidelines, who are there? Who are on the sides? Watching mingling, trying to influence. It's a group of very ambitious parents. And you also have to deal with those as coaches or as uh, leaders of clubs. And uh, they are a s huge resource. Without parents in sports, we wouldn't have anything because it's a voluntary organization. But also, when it comes to these things, we know it's debated. It might be challenging sometimes. <coughs> so these rights, it's uh, valid for all children up until the age of 12, especially the rights that we will have a look at. And we're not going to make any difference. That's what they say in the statutes, based on gender or, uh, or um, their parents' gender or sexual orientation, religion. Um, uh, disabilities or abilities, etc. No difference on anyone. Everybody should have the same rights to do sports and should be protector under, protected under the, same, uh, under the same system. So this is very fundamental in if as a, a sport for all organization. <coughs> uh, now it's 10 to, no, 5 to 10. So what we're going to do is to take a break. And then when we come back, we're going to work uh, with these rights to create even more understanding about these rights uh, from your part before we continue. Okay? So 10 past 10.